morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. Let's sing this thing a call to worship. Join me for Here I Am to Worship. pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the day that you bless us with and the opportunity to gather this morning. God, we thank you for uh, just what you're doing in our church. And God, we're asking that you'll do the same that you have been this morning. God, that your spirit will come and dwell in our midst. And God, we will allow our lives to be a reflection of who you are. Now, God, this morning as we continue looking at our B series of Be Loving in Second Samuel, God, I pray that we'll come to realization that there are times that we can be hurt right in the middle of your will. But, God, the Bible says that you fight for us, God, that you take good care of us. And so, God, I pray this morning that our hearts and our minds will be open during our time of worship through song. Pray for Brother Keith and the choir as they lead us. And, God, as we open your word, we ask for your spirit to move in our midst. We'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning uh, to you guys. It is good to see you. It is spring break week. And so folks are traveling and will be traveling. But we're thankful that you're here uh, this morning to worship with us and be a part of our service this morning. Uh, last week was a great week. Revival was a great time. Thank you so much for being here uh, and being a part of that. It was, a, it was a great service each time we had an opportunity to gather, and uh, hopefully you received a blessing for being a part of that and being a part of our revival services. Uh, multiple folks said that have preached here before that the spirit of this church is just continuing to climb, and that's a, a great compliment for our staff and our deacons and what we're trying to do here. So thank you so much for that and being willing to be a part of our services last week. A couple of quick announcements. If you are our guest, you received a worship guide when you came in. Uh, there's a tear-off section there on the right side. If you have any questions regarding our church, you can fill that out, put it in the offering plate when it comes by, leave it on the seat. Uh, we'll try to answer any questions that you may have regarding our church in the upcoming days. Also, there will be no Wednesday night supper this Wednesday night due to spring break. Uh, so they're going to get another week off from being back there in the kitchen. That will start back next week, but we want to make sure you're aware of those uh, two things. Hey, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're pleased to receive a blessing of being a part of it. I know many of our kids are already in the balcony, uh, but if there are any kids who would like to go to his kids this morning, if you'll make your way to the back right corner this time, they'll take good care of you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Let's stand once again as we sing our opening song, our greeting song this morning. And that's why we're here, assembled as a group of believers to declare His majesty. Sing with me now. We declare Your majesty.
Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the ability to come and openly worship you as the Lord and Savior. Lord, we lift up the ones that are sick and hurting, the ones that are going through treatment. You know each and every need, Lord. Lord, I pray for the ones that are here this morning. Lord, I don't know each and every situation here, but the ones that are here that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, those are the ones I'm speaking to right now. I'm asking you, if you're not right with your Lord and Savior, that you do not let this service close before you make a decision for him, because you're not guaranteed another moment on this earth. Now, Lord, I pray that you will bless these gifts as we give back a small portion of what you've blessed us with. Bless the giver. Now, I pray that you forgive us, Lord, because we're all sinners. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
you have your Bible this morning, we're going to in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. I entitled this, Be Loving. Love, by definition, is this in the dictionary, an intense feeling of deep affection, a great interest and pleasure in something, a person or thing that one loves. The definition of loving is the feeling or showing love or great care. This morning, I would like for us to look at an Old Testament passage, maybe a passage that you've read. When you read the Bible through, it might not be a passage that you have studied or heard preached on many times. But I believe this passage of Scripture shows us what it means to be loving. 2 Samuel chapter 10, beginning in verse 5, if you have your Bible, it says this. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his steep. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came unto the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon saith unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his own servants unto thee to search the city and to spy on it and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told it unto David, he sent to them to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. How are we to love? Well, the basic definition of this message is that we are to love like we have never been hurt before. Now, you may say, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know the pain that I have dealt with. Well, it could be asked like this. Have you ever been hurt trying to love someone that you care for greatly? The answer is yes. Have you ever been hurt trying to love someone only to have your legs cut out from under you? The answer would be yes. And better yet, have you ever been hurt while you're doing exactly what God has called you to do? Have you been hurt right in the middle of God's will? Have you been hurt in the church doing what you want? I say oftentimes there's no hurt like church hurt, and I mean that with all of my heart. Nothing hurts worse than being hurt by the church of Jesus Christ. These individuals that we're reading about in 2 Samuel chapter 10 were in the absolute perfect will of God, doing exactly what God wanted them to do. In this case, what King David wanted them to do. And we're going to see that they were humiliated to the point of their beard being shaved off and their robe being cut and half of their buttocks showing, all trying to do what God was trying to show them and to use them to do things in the only way that he can. And so in other words, in the, like the individuals in this particular passage of Scripture, you will be hurt, you will be offended, and I need you to understand that first blank on your handout there. It simply says this, that no matter how spiritual you are, there will be a time that you are offended and hurt by the doings of someone else. It doesn't matter if you read your Bible every day. It doesn't matter if you spend hours in prayer every day. It doesn't matter if you're at church every time the doors open. It doesn't matter if you do all of those things. There will be a time that you will be hurt and you will be offended by someone else. Just because you're in the will of God does not mean that you will not have to deal with this hurt. It doesn't mean that God's going to always make sure that doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that always God's going to always steer you from another direction. So no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how much you're in the Word of God, there will be a time that you are offended and hurt by the doing of someone else. Luke chapter 17 verse 1 says it like this. This is Jesus talking to the disciples and it says, It is impossible but that offenses will come. In other words, it's coming. You might as well get ready for it. You're not going to omit it. You're not going to be able to avoid it. You're not going to be able to walk around it. Jesus, the Savior of the world, looking at the disciples and says, hey, it's going to come. You are going to get hit. You are going to get blindsided. It will happen no matter what. This is going to take place. But so many times in us as Christians, we, this, this offense comes and we get bitter and we get frustrated and our feelings get hurt. And we get mad and we want to retaliate and we want to get even. If you're like me, maybe I'm just talking about myself. But you want to get even and you want to go toe-to-toe and you want to figure this out. And we look at this idea and we say that, hey, since it is a biblical fact that we will be offended, based on Luke 17, verse 1, 
We must learn how to deal with it. In other words, how do we deal with it when we are offended? How do we love those when they have hurt us and they have ridiculed us and they have called us pain? Well, the first point this morning is this. Being hurt by doing right can cause us not to love. Being hurt by doing right can cause us not to love. In other words, if I'm in the middle of God's will and I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do, and somebody comes in and cuts the legs out from under what I'm trying to do as a pastor or a staff member or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or just a body of believers, sometimes hurt causes us not to love. And so the very first and probably the most important statement of this message is that God will use offenses in your life to make you into what he wants you to be. In other words, sometimes it takes the worst things done to you to bring out the best in you. Sometimes it makes you need to realize that your legs do need to be cut out from under you so that you can be what God wants you to be. Or it could be said that you'll never reach the heights that God wants you to get to if you never really understand what this means and understand what it means to be hurt. Let me give you an example. In New Zealand, it's amazing. I wrote this message a while back, and a buddy of mine I play golf with, his wife is in New Zealand right now seeing her brother And I thought about that when I was looking over my stuff yesterday, but neither here nor there. In New Zealand, it's the home of the more flightless birds than anywhere else in the world. Yeah, that's useless knowledge for most of us, but I'm going somewhere for this. There's more flightless birds in any other part of the world in New Zealand. And the the statistic is that 43% of birds in New Zealand cannot fly. Now, you would say, well, why in the world can they not fly? They obviously can't do what they need to do. They can't get around. They can't fly here or there. Why is that? Well, if you study this, you will see that the birds that fall in this category have little small stubs for wings. And the reason that the wings are underdeveloped is because they they never have to fly. They never have to, to grow into having full wings in order to fly. And that's because there are no predators in New Zealand that are attacking the birds. All right, just stay with me. You're thinking, what are we doing? It's not National Geographic, Bobby. I know it's not. But the idea is, and they got little stubs. They're trying to figure it out, but they don't have to fly away because they're not worried about snakes or they're not worried about wolves. They're not worried about things that are trying to eat them and kill them. And so when you look at this from the aspect of where I'm trying to go, since there are no predators, there's no need to fly. And when there's no need to fly, you lose the ability to fly, right? It's kind of like folks in a church that have a talent to sing and they don't use it. It just blows my mind. Like, why would you not use your talent to sing? You know God's given that to you and he can take it from you. And the more you say no to God, the more difficult it becomes if you know anything about church life. And so use the ability, use the talents. So the birds in New Zealand, 43% of them, have come to the realization that there's no predator trying to kill me, so there's no need to fly. When there's no need to fly, you lose the ability to fly. But the point of this whole statement is this. It takes a predator to create the wings that have the desire to go higher and higher. In other words, you're one of two birds here. You're one of the birds of the 43% of New Zealand with stubs of the wings and you're over here scratching around in the dirt. Or you are a bird that that allows your wings to be created and when you are are offensed or when things are going against you, you mount up on on wings like eagles and fly. The idea of this passage is Isaiah chapter 40. In verse 31 it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In in other words, the the birds, 43% of the birds in New Zealand do not have wings, so therefore they don't fly. Many of us, when opposition comes, we're asking God to remove that opposition. We're asking God to take it away from us. We're asking God, why am I in the middle of this pain? Why am I in the middle of this valley? I don't know why I have so much opposition. I don't know why so many people are against me. I don't know why I'm having to deal with this all of my life. Why do people hate me? Why do I have enemies? But if you look at these birds and you look at your life, you're one of two things. You're one of those that's sitting there on the ground scratching around. Or you're one of those when you're attacked by the predator, you're going to fly higher and higher and higher so that you can be what God wants you to be. And so that you develop into who God wants you to be as a person, as a man, as a woman, as a boy, as a girl. Think about an airplane. I love to fly. If I had extra money, I'd get a pilot's license. But I absolutely love airplanes. 
But when you study this and you see what this is about, many pilots often want to know the wind direction. And they want to know the wind direction so that when they take off, they want to fly into the wind so they can climb faster to a higher altitude. The opposition causes them to go higher, right? It allows them to get to their cruising altitude of 35,000 feet or whatever it may be. But many of us say, hey, I want to go the opposite direction of the opposition. I don't want to have to deal with that. That just like an airplane flies or just like a bird with fully developed wings flies when a predator comes after us, when we understand this idea, opposition enables you to do things that you would not be able to do had you not been under attack. Because you're under attack, God shows you that you can handle it. Because you're under attack, God shows you that you can mount up on wings like eagles and fly and be who God wants you to be. Sometimes it takes the worst things in your life, the most difficult times in your life to bring out the best in your life. Sometimes it takes you to come to the realization that you can't do it by yourself or I can't do it by myself and I need God to work in my life. This is the case of the story in 2 Samuel. The context of 2 Samuel, David had a friend, the king of Ammon, whose name was Nahash, and Nahash died. Nahash dies, and Hanan comes in and becomes the young priest. He comes to take his place. And so if you recall what we just read a moment ago in 2 Samuel, he passes away. And so David says, hey, I'm not able to go, so I'm going to send two people. I'm going to send two people unarmed, not prepared for war, not prepared for battle. They're basically ambassadors from me, and I'm going to send them to where he's at to show my respect, to show my condolences of the passing of his father. And so the context of this is these two ambassadors, these two people are submitting to the authority of the king. They're submitting to King David, and they're going to go to this, we're going to just call it a reception, and they're going to be there to show the respect for King David for the loss of his particular father. So these two guys, these ambassadors, were ambassadors of King David. Much like you and I today, we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ, royal ambassadors, RAs. If you ever went through RAs as a young man in the Southern Baptist world, you know all about that and what that means. We're basically an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So these two guys, they show up, and they're doing their thing, and and then we see a shift in the whole scene here. The people began to wonder why these two guys were here. They began to wonder, why are they there? Are they really there to show respect to the king of Ammon? Are they really sure to respect to to the prince that is now on the throne, per se? Or are these two guys there to come in and to take over? Or are they there to try to figure out what the prince is trying to do? And so if you read in 2 2 Samuel chapter 10 that we just looked at, you're going to see that there are some folks that try to get in the ear of the prince. And they begin to ask questions like, hey, they are not here because they care. They're not here because they respect you. They're here because they're wanting to spy out the land. They're here because they want to see what's going on and and be able to bring their army to come in and to attack and to defeat you. So this young prince, who obviously knew who King David was, should have known the heart of King David, should have known what David was trying to do, should have known that David did genuinely care. But this young prince began to listen to these people who were saying they're not here because they're here. They care. They're here because they're spies. They're here because they want to take over, which leads to the next statement. You have to be cognizant. You must be cognizant of who you are allowing to whisper in your ear. You must be cognizant to who you are allowing to whisper in your ear. You know, the same thing that happens in 2 Samuel chapter 10 happens in church life. You know, you get a group over here, and they, and they get to talking, and it starts off simple. Then it's like, you know, well, Brother Bobby didn't do this, and now Brother Bobby didn't do that, and it starts as one. And then instead of calling Brother Bobby, which is what the Bible says to do in Matthew chapter 18, they call the chairman of the deacons, and that's Ken Barfoot. And then Ken Barfoot calls me, and I'm going to ask this question, Ken, who called you? And one or two things going to happen. Either Ken's going to tell me who calls, or I'm going to hang up the phone. That's how I operate. Right, And the idea of this is, hey, this prince should have known the desires of King David. But this prince was listening to people that were putting the wrong things in his ear. And so now we're going to see a major 180 degree change in the story of 2 Samuel chapter 10. What started as, I'm sending my ambassadors because I care, now turns into my ambassadors being under attack. So the prince, I'm assuming, kind of sits back. He's listening to these people, and he says, maybe you're right. 
Maybe they are spies. Maybe they are looking at the land. Maybe they are doing what you're thinking. So now they're being falsely accused. They're being falsely accused of their motives. They're being falsely accused of their desires. They're being falsely accused of their entire reason why they're there. Now they're on the defense. And the prince says, okay, that's why you're here. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut off half your beard. I'm going to cut off half your beard. The culture at this time, the beard was a sign of dignity, a sign of respect for a man. And so he says, you know what, because you're trying to play me, because you're trying to get in the middle of what I'm trying to do, I'm going to humiliate you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut off half your beard. And not only that, I'm going to cut off the skirt of your tunic. They're wearing robes because this is a formal occasion so that your rear end is exposed. And so in other words, I'm going to send you back to King David with your head tucked between your tail, right? Let's just be honest. That's what that means. I'm going to send you back because you're here spying on what I'm doing, not because you care. Well, we know they were there because King David sent them. We know they were there because King David cared enough to send them. Now, think about those two ambassadors. Can you imagine the humiliation? Can you imagine how they felt? Half their beards are taken off. Their rear end is showing. These guys are humiliated, and they're humiliated for doing exactly what the king had asked them to do. That happens in church life. You can feel, I believe it all in my heart, you can be right in the will of God, and you're doing exactly what God wants you to do, and you're right in the middle of a fellowship, and everything's going here, and everything's going right, and then out of nowhere, your legs are cut out from under you. You think to yourself, what in the world have I done? God, I'm doing exactly what you want me to do, but yet my beard's getting cut off, and my rear end's showing. You may say, what does that mean? Well, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They might have looked at these two guys and said, hey, dude, at least you're not in a fiery furnace. Suck it up. Your beard will grow back. They might have looked at Daniel and said, hey, at least, at least you're not in the middle of a lion's den. Hey, don't worry about that. It's just your beard. It's just your rear end. But these guys were wounded for loving. They were wounded for doing exactly what God had wanted them to do. In their eyes, these two ambassadors would probably have wanted to be physically hurt than to be hurt the way they are. I've all, I'm the guy that always says this, like, I would rather us fight, this is your preacher talking here, I would rather us throw hands at one another than you talk down to me, right? I, I would rather us handle it physically than you talk to me like I don't have any respect. That's just kind of how I'm wired, not that I want to go outside and fight, but if you do, we'll figure it out. But the idea is, hey, they're struggling. They're wounded, they're hurt, they are there because their boss, their king, their, the guy that they look up to sent them because he couldn't make it. And now they're exposed, humiliated, and embarrassed. And like every other church, they're probably being talked about. They're probably being made fun of. They're probably being ridiculed. They are the topic of the conversation. So what do we do when we're doing the best we can? When we're trying to love as we should. The second point is simply this. Being hurt can cause us to be vindictive. Sometimes we're hurt so bad that all we want to do is we want to get even. Sometimes we're hurt so bad we want to throw up our hands we want to quit. The cutting off of the beard at that time and the beard to this day in the Middle East is a mark of distinction. It's a mark of honor. It's a mark of maturity. It's a token of authority. The beard is important. And so when they shaved off half the beard, it began to tamper with their rank. Now remember, they're ambassadors of King David. They are somebody important. They have a title. But most importantly, they are men doing what they needed to be doing. So when half the beard was shaved off, it tampered with their mark. It tampered with their identity. It tampered with their rank. Look at verse 5 in 2 Samuel chapter 10 again. It says, And when they told it unto David, he sent to them... Because the men were greatly ashamed. I need you to realize that if you live for God and you seek to do the will of God, there will be times when you find yourself wounded for doing God's perfect will. That there are going to be times that you're going to find yourself hurt because of what you're doing. Just because you're doing the will of God doesn't mean that you're exempt from what's happening. But look at what happens. This is how we know David was a very good leader. David says, hey, These boys are headed home. Our soldiers are coming back. Our ambassadors are coming back. They're humiliated. They are embarrassed. But King David, the word says, hey, I'm not going to let you come all the way back home. 
I'm the one that commissioned you to go. I'm not going to let you come all the way back home embarrassed and humiliated. I'm going to meet you. I'm going to send a servant out there. We're going to intercept you. Have you ever heard this story before? It's kind of like the prodigal son. Think about it with me for just a second. He says that, hey, I'm not going to let you come back and let everyone see your humiliation. I'm not going to let everyone see your wounds. I'm not going to let everyone see your embarrassment. So the king says, hey, I want you to go to Jericho, and I want you to stay there until your beard grows back in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5. It says, and the king said, hey, I want you to tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. Again, it's like the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son we're going to look at in just a moment in Luke chapter 15. The father did not want him to come back and and look the way that he looked. He didn't want him to look like he was worn down. He didn't want him to look like he was embarrassed and he was hurt at what he had gone through. So the Bible teaches in Luke chapter 15 that the father takes off running. I imagine he's on the porch, sees his son coming across the horizon. He takes off running. He gets there, gives him a kiss, gives him a robe. He covers him, puts shoes on his feet, puts a ring on his finger, and basically said, hey, I want you to come back restored. I want you to come back ready to go. I don't want you to come back broken. I don't want you to come back hurt. I don't want you to come back embarrassed. I love you no matter what, and I want everybody to know that I love you and that you are restored. Look at Luke chapter 15 for just a moment. It begins in verse 20. It says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf, kill it, let's eat, let's be merry. For this my son was dead, he's alive, he was lost, and he was found. Man, what a powerful testimony. What a powerful testimony of 2 Samuel chapter 10 and Luke chapter 15. But in 2 Samuel chapter 10 verse 5, King David says, Hey, I want you to go to Jericho. Well, the prodigal son didn't say that. What's the difference of Jericho? Hey, when they talk about you, when they offend you, when they falsely accuse you, in Bobby's words, when they gripe about everything that you do, Don't get mad. Don't get bitter. Don't get frustrated. Love them like you've never been hurt and go to Jericho. Why Jericho? Well, why is Jericho important? The definition of Jericho uh, is is sweet fragrance, right? The the definition of the game. When you look at the word Jericho by definition, it means a sweet fragrance. In other words, David was saying, even though you've been done wrong, Even though you've been hurt, even though you've been offended, I want you to go to Jericho. I want you to go to the place of sweet fragrance. Why? Because King David knew these two guys wanted to get even. King David knew these two guys were hurt. And they were probably going to rally the truth and say, hey, you know what? You're going to humiliate me. You're going to shave off half my beard. You're going to cut my robe or my rear end showing. I'm going to get you back. And the good leader steps in and says, hey, no, I don't need you to come back doing that right now. I need you to go to Jericho, and I need you to heal. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to be bitter. I don't want you to be hard. I don't want you to plan your vengeance. I want you to go to Jericho, and I want you to stay sweet. I want you to go to Jericho, and I want you to heal. And then he says something very powerful. King David says something very transforming here in 2 Samuel chapter 10. Look at verse 5. It says, hey, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. In other words, when you're hurt, church, there's a time where you have to sit there, be quiet, be restored, so that you can love like you've never been hurt before. That's what he's teaching right here. Hey, he didn't say, cover your ear in and come on back. No, no, no. He said, I want your beard to grow back. It's not the end of the world. I understand that. Your beard will grow back. Your respect will grow back. Your honor will grow back. But what King David is saying, he's saying, hey, I sent you. You are my ambassadors, and now I'm going to fight for you. Now I'm going to restore you. Now I want you to know that you need to remain sweet. Stay at Jericho. And when you're restored, come back. Exodus 14, 14 says that the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. 
In other words, if you allow the Lord to fight your battles, you hold your peace, your victory, and it shall be yours. God knows how to vindicate for his own children. The question is, do you believe that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords fights for you? You would say yes. If that's the case, then you need to realize that the king will fight for you if you stop fighting. There has to come a time where you say, you know what? I remember what Mike Moore said to me two years, six months, three days, 14 minutes, and nine seconds ago. Some of y'all do. Don't act like you don't. And boy, that just made me mad. I ain't never heard Mike say anything bad, but I'm going to use Mike. And boy, it hurt my feelings. And I just don't like Mike anymore. I ain't got nothing for Mike Moore anymore because of that. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to get Mike back. We're going to try to get even with Mike. And the word is simply saying here, hey, you can't win. We can't win. But Christ can win in and through us. And so King David says, hey, you need to go to Jericho. You need to stay sweet. You need to allow the bitterness to leave. You need to allow your beard to be grown back. You need to allow your rear end to be covered. And you need to realize that, that our God is a God of vengeance, right? Romans chapter 12 tells that in verse 19. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. There comes a time that the king will fight for us if we will stop fighting. The third point this morning is simply this. Being calm can help us love. This is probably more to me than anybody else in this room. Being calm can help us love. In other words, sometimes we need to stay at Jericho a little bit longer. In other times, we need to just stay at Jericho a little bit longer. When we think we're ready, we're not. We need to stay there a little bit longer. We need to stay sweet. We need to calm down. Like I say, just pump the brakes. Just settle down for just a moment. Let it come back into rhythm. How many of y'all have ever taken a nitroglycerin? Don't raise your hand because we're, we're going to have a cardiologist moving here in a second. But you know what a nitroglycerin is, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's a little, it's a little pill about yay. It's a little bottle about yay big. My mom's had them before. And, and when you have chest pains, you put it on your tongue, right? You know what you do? Yeah, you put it on your tongue, and everybody says you get a massive headache, but it's supposed to help you with your heart. And so when you think about a nitroglycerin, we know it as it helps the heart. You have a chest pain, you take a nitroglycerin. If you look up nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin in the de- dictionary, it says this. A substance used to blow up bridges. Seriously, I'm not making that up. I wish I was. That'd be awesome. Semicolon. Here it is. A substance used to heal hearts. Stay with me. If you have a heart problem, you take a nitroglycerin. The point here is that your words, because you're hurt, can either blow up bridges or heal broken hearts. That's the point of the message. Just because I'm hurt doesn't mean you're right to fire back, and I can fire back with the best of them. Just because you're upset doesn't mean that. And so, hey, we got a nitroglycerin that that is basically a lifesaver, and then you you see me calling that puppy in the definition, and it says, hey, this same thing is used to blow up a bridge. How are we using it? In other words, stay at Jericho. Calm down. I know you want to get even. God's going to let your beard grow back. God's going to cover your rear end. Our God is the God who can. Look at Romans 12, 19 again in full context. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. God doesn't take offense lightly. God doesn't just put it under the rug. God wants you to go to Jericho. God wants you to remain sweet. God wants you to have the right attitude. And God says, if you do these things, I will take care of you. Do you know what happens in this story? When they did what he said do, their beard grew back, their reputation started coming back. God started covering the mess and started blessing and promoting them in the presence of their enemies. Y'all remember that sermon on Be Confident, Psalm 23? That's not coincidental. And then King David says, it's go time, Matt. King David turns to Joab. Joab's bad to the bone. He says, hey, I want you to take the mightiest men of the army. I want you to go down there. And I want you to wipe them out. Joab's my kind of guy. You mess with my ambassadors, I'm sending everybody and their mama to take you out. So look at what it says in verse 6 and 7. And when the children of Ammon saw 
And they stayed before David, the children of Ammon, sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Reho and the Syrians of Zoba or Zaba, 20,000 footmen of king of Mecca and 1,000 men of Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. Look at verse 9. When Joab saw the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. Verse 12, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for our cities of our God and the Lord to do that which seemeth his good. And Joab drew nigh and the people that were with him unto the battle against the Syrians and they fled before him. Joab went down there and handled business. It was far worse than half a beard being shaven off and a rear end showing. Let's wrap it up. If we're honest, this Old Testament passage speaks today in such a way that we can understand, in such a way that we can comprehend. Psalm 119 says in verse 165, that great peace have they which love the law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm, uh, Luke chapter 17 verse 1 says, hey, offenses are coming. Psalm 119 says that nothing shall offend thee. There's a place you can get in God step by step to move beyond the bitterness. And here's that place. You can be a peacemaker. And be at peace that not everyone is at peace with you. You can be a peacemaker and be at peace that not everyone is at peace with you. There are people that all they say is something negative. No matter. I could have brought Bill Gaither. Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, R.C. Sproul, Spurgeon, and somebody's going to gripe. Somebody's going to gripe. But when I wrote that down in my notes, I come to the realization that this, hey, you can only control you. In other words, it costs nothing to stay in your lane. So when we love, we understand what this means. When we're going through hard times, we understand. So what do we do? When we're hurt and we don't want to love, we go to Jericho. And we allow that sweet spirit to come in. We stay sweet and let the king do the rest. You can be loving if you don't allow bitterness to creep in. You can be loving and know that God desires to fight your battles. You can be loving when the time comes that you stop whining and make it about you. There's a movie. It's old now called Black Hawk Down. Have you ever seen it? Black Hawk Down is a great movie. In this movie, the Delta Force is tasked with going to Africa for an extraction. If you see the movie, you know that the choppers have been shot down in enemy territory. The commanding officer decides that if they stay there, they're going to be killed. So he gives the command, get in the Humvee and drive. One of the soldiers raises his hands. His fingers have been shot off, shot as well as his body. He says, sir, to the commanding officer, I've been shot. The commanding officer responds, we've all been shot. Get in the Humvee and drive. What does that matter? We've all been hurt. Get in the Humvee and go forward. We've all had our legs cut out from under us. That was an edited version of what the actual uh, movie says. In other words, stop whining. Go to Jericho. When you hurt, pray. When you're hurting, ask God to move. When people do you wrong, be loving. Love like you've never been hurt. Well, Jericho is a good place to be, physically and biblically. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the power of the gospel, and God, we thank you for the realization that you're good and you're faithful, and God, that you're going to see us through, that you're going to guide, guard, and direct us. And God, this morning, I pray that if there's anyone here that's just hurt, Maybe something that was said on purpose or maybe something that was said incidentally. God, may they ask for forgiveness today. Maybe they've hurt someone and they need to ask for forgiveness there. God, maybe they're lost and on the way to hell. And they need to experience the forgiveness of all forgiveness. And the love of all love, the agape love of God the Father to mankind. God, during this time of invitation, I pray that if there's anyone that needs to make a decision, whether it's salvation, whether it's a time to pray, whether it's a time to be a part of our church family, God, maybe they've been visiting for a year and a half. They sit in the same place, and they need to make that move. God, whatever it may be, 
God, most importantly, I pray that everybody walks out of this building in accord with you, in fellowship with you, in unity with you. God, maybe, may we need to realize at times that we just need to go to Jericho. God, thank you for fighting our battles. Thank you for allowing the beards to grow back. Thank you for covering our, weary, our rear ends. God, thank you for taking care of the offenses. So, God, during this time, we ask for your spirit to move. We give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the song.